Are we up? It seems like we're up. We're ready for takeoff. <laughs> Bit of a gray day today here. No rain, I think, though. The forecast is for gray. Sun peeking out partway along, back to the gray. It's a uh, weekend here in Asaksa, coming towards the end of the year. And uh, yesterday, last night, was busy, busy, busy. The bars were all cranked up. We don't have any cone alignment today. Should I set that up before we start the stream? I don't know. Okay, good morning, good morning. Oh, coffee cup. I got my coffee early today. <laughs> I had to. Today's Saturday. The shop will be open. We'll be opening at 10 o'clock after the stream. And I'm the duty guy today. And actually, there isn't, I think, anybody else here today. That's the problem. When employees work real employee time, Monday to Friday, they're gone. And we haven't yet got shop staff rotations. We don't have enough people to do this. So, so I'm the hot seat guy today. So I went out to get my lunch. That's why I've got a coffee here already. I got my lunch because I won't have any time to go out and get it later. So I've got a sandwich in the back there. I got a cup of coffee. Good morning, good morning. No paper out because nobody's due here today. What, what I was talking about, the staff, that's the, the office type staff. Nothing to do with the printers. The printers upstairs work their own schedule. But as it happens, there's nobody here today. Quite often Ishikawa-san works Saturday, Suga-san works Saturday, but today nobody is there. But I don't know that until my alarm goes off at 6. I stumble out of bed, head to the toilet, go upstairs, get to the freezer, and I find out that there's no buttons there for tomorrow, for today. <laughs> so, But I don't know that. If I had any brains, I'd go up there at night, check for the morning, and I know I can set my alarm clock a bit later. Whatever. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Okay, what have we got here? Oh, this is fun. This is, I know, I left this here so I can remember it. This is one of the people who were here yesterday. Guy dropped in. I'm sure I can, you know, you're not supposed to dox people. It's not doxing. This is what the guy does. He's got a podcast. Real fun guy. There was two guys came together. This is not his job. He's got a job involved in uh, baseball bats is his job. But uh, he's got a podcast. He's got a podcast. So there it is. Have a look later on. I guess dedicated to Godzilla and his rubber-suited friends. So <laughs> we attract a certain kind of people here. <laughs> so actually, I think too, I should have paid a bit more attention. We had a long, long chat about it, him and his friends and the baseball bats and stuff like that. And I think he said he's going to be doing the next podcast. It's today or tomorrow from here in Tokyo. I think he's staying over in Shinjuku. There's a certain Godzilla attraction over in Shinjuku. And I believe, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you didn't you didn't we didn't catch it too hard to read just a sec yeah the font uh, the, the the original font whatever i i don't uh whatever it's hard to read but the the, the point being here's his uh, here's his real kaijucast.com and if i remember correctly he is going to be uh, podcasting it was today or tomorrow or something so over you go. <laughs> we had fun time. These days now, you know, I, I was here yesterday. We had staff. Those guys came in. And like I said, it, most of the conversation was about baseball bats. My God. Then the next uh, gentleman that was in was from Canada. And we ended up talking about, uh, well, not ended up. It was his job. He's here in Japan to help uh, the Japanese uh, culture agency. Who is in, they're, they're, they're involved with protecting and preserving old cultural stuff like temples and shrines and, and books and whatever. And this man's job is, uh, he's from Canada, and he's involved in conservation. And he told me that a really neat thing. They're wrapping buildings here. They're like, they're wrapping the whole shrine and or temple or whatever, and heat treating it. I don't think this is a secret. I'm, I'm sure he's been, he's been uh, academic papers about it. And they're heat treating it to, to kill bugs. Instead of, uh, I think, the thing he mentioned was in the old days, X years ago, they used to have all these various uh, sprays and things that they put in there. But one of the main sprays that was bug killing turned out to be a, a greenhouse gas. So they can't use it anymore. So they're looking for more, uh, more uh, ecologically friendly uh, systems for doing this. So they're heat treating. They're wrapping entire buildings 
heating them, humidifying them, doing whatever they need to do to keep the soil trying, and uh, killing the bugs with heat. In, at least in, a, in one nutshell, that's the, uh, that's the thing they're doing. I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. Okay, before we start work today on the carving, we have some prints, and okay. Actually, John Becker is not here this morning, our mod who usually jumps in first with these kind of comments. Who printed it? What is it? Can they help you with visa from Moko Hong Kong? Can they help you with visa from Moko Hong Kong? Somebody's got a chicken meisters on here from Kubota, of course. What's the print? It's another vertical doi print. Yes, of course. Who's this? This is Mika-san. Hi. Yes, it's Kubota-san doing another. They look nice. They look nice. <laughs> Kurigami won't swing at this. We're talking about baseball. <laughs> Looking nice, looking nice, looking nice. You saw, what was it, one week ago we had the Funabori print, this week we had here. The reason these are coming bang, bang, bang is because the doi people have been doing their own reprintings of this stuff. And this is really interesting at the moment. These blocks are not mine, they're from the doi Hunger Company. A few years ago we started a situation where we went to them and said, look, you guys are sleeping, your business is not active, can we use some of your blocks? We'll print, put it back in print, pay you a royalty. And because her business wasn't active, she very happy, sure, let's go, let's do this. What have we got to lose? You know, what could go wrong? So we've been doing that over the past uh, four, five, six years. We've been using old doy blocks to make modern versions of them. But her business herself has now come alive. Since the pandemic started, there's been huge demand for this sort of thing. And she, seeing our success with this, says, well, maybe I can do this too. Of course she can. So she herself has been sending her blocks out, including this one and Matsushima and the Funabori we saw the other day. She herself has been hiring downtown printers to do this. So at the moment, out in the market, there are a number of these doi prints, some printed by Moku Hankan here, uh, by our printers, and some printed by the doi company. And how to tell them apart is the embalm. Well, one is the quality I better not go there, but you can tell them apart by the quality, and you can tell them apart by the embossing. I haven't yet embossed this, but it will go in the in the you know, it will go in the margin here. Mokohankan, our name will go on here. Cooperation with Doi Hanga Mokohankan Kubota Printer, and her versions have a black box here with the printer, and it'll say uh, Carver Harada in Japanese, and it'll say printer whoever she hired to print it. But we are being much more careful than she is. She doesn't really know the difference between what's good and what's bad. This is the granddaughter of the original owner of the Doi Hunger Company. But right now, out in the market, there are a bunch of these prints in two formats. And I have no idea where she is selling them or what the prices are. All I know is about our side of it. So I have to emboss that, but I'm not going to do that on the stream this morning. Let's do some real work instead. Okay, we are, as you can see, we are almost done on this block. Again, we started in this corner, came around, carving out. The black parts get left, of course. All I've done is I've carved away the white parts in the middle, all the different kinds of curves and waves and around and around and around and I am now back up. I have just got this last little corner to do which we'll do this morning and then I've got to clear out all the stuff in the middle and I have to clear out around the edges. So I won't be finishing it during the stream this morning but we are going to get close. And then in the next stream, Monday, whatever, let's worry about that on Monday.
If we're gonna, about the gradations, yes, anybody can make one gradation. It's really dead easy, no problem at all. Bang, 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 it's done. Making 100 or whatever the number is, making all the gradations the same, that's difficult. Excuse me a second. Making all the gradations the same is tough, and that's the mark of an experienced printer. You've got to see, you've got to look at each one. It's going a bit too high, pull it back the next one. It's going a bit too low, pull it up the next one. And you can't see, when you've got your brush, you're doing your gradation, you can't see how much pigment is in there. All you can see is how much you're putting on, where you're putting on, and you can see the finished result. It is difficult. It's one of the real things that, uh, what's that expression? It separates the men from the boys whatever a, a contemporary expression should be, I don't know, but that, that's, that's the point. Anybody can do a couple of gradations. To do them all the same like that is very, very difficult. When I did the big clearing of the key block or surfer girl, how do I know that the wood won't split or crack? Well. What can I say? We, we have chosen the wood. We have created this by ourselves. We know what the piece of wood is capable of. I know how hard I'm hitting. I know what I'm doing. I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. So this is not just some random piece of wood. We are uh, carefully selecting our wood. I know what it's capable of. Gradients determine the great printers. Well, printing a good gradation is one of the things that, of course, that, that's where your skill shows. You know. Zoom in a bit. I guess I've got to be careful. I'm not using the scope, so it's easy to get out of the field of view here. So. Someone's saying, whenever we see prints from Kubota on my desk, they look immaculate. Do you ever find errors with his work? I'm not sure what the word error means. I know. You know when we get a deck from him, maybe this deck, maybe at the bottom of there, there were two or three with corners cut. He uses the first few sheets to build up and get organized and get going. He's not God. He does, you know, errors. It's, the problems come in difficulty of communication. He's working outside, not here. I can't see what he's doing minute by minute by minute. So I've got to communicate what I want to him. I send a sample. I call him up when the job is starting. Hey, Kubota san please uh, take a look at this, take a look at this, be a bit on that mountain, I'd like such and such. So I talk to him about what I want. But he has a lifetime, and I'm talking 50 years plus, of experience printing not Dave's work. And a lot of the ukiyo-e printing and, and Japanese traditional printing in the last half a century has been of a style that I don't like. So a lot of these outside printers they tend to do the key blocks darker than I want. They will be a little more careless with gradations. They also include a lot of what's called gomazuri on that sky to make a smooth gradation. Dumping water makes it easy, but too much water, you get a model effect. And that's become really common. The Ginza Watanabe prints, all published these days, are all fully modeled with water. They look awful. They don't know or they don't care anymore. But Kubota-san grew up in an environment where that was common. So it's difficult for he and I to establish what is going to be the norm for this stuff. So it's not that he finds errors, not that I find errors. Whenever there's something I don't like, it's mostly a different, we've, there's been a communication problem. So we want him to work here. We've told him we'll pay him like double if you come here and do it. You can work surrounded by the young ladies, you know, because we want to watch him and learn from him. He won't do it. At his age, he thinks of himself as retired. He wants to sit in his room, watch TV, and make prints at his own pace. He won't come here. And we've tried to do the, uh, what's the word? The obligation in Kubota-san. At your age, we have young, you have an obligation to pass this on. It's your duty to do this. Come on over here, at least one day a month or something. He says, I got no obligations to anybody. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah.
he doesn't he doesn't do obligation just laughs at me <laughs> and he's right it's okay you know he spent his entire career doing this and his job and his he's a shogun in a craftsman he has no obligation whatsoever to anybody else i get that in comments from people who have watched the remembering a carver video some people make a comment negative about Ito-san. He had an obligation to teach you. Why did he say no? He had no obligation whatsoever towards me. His position in this society, as with Kubota-san, his position is a printmaking craftsman. That's what he trained us, that's what he does, that's the exchange of money. He has no obligation to anybody else for anything else. I'm missing a lot of this, I'm sorry, whatever I'm I missing this, you know. He is a super nice guy, you know. I, I nothing I said there is in any way negative about him. Kubodasan, we all we have so much respect for him. Because he's he's not just good at what he does, he is also just a really warm person. He's really he's really just nice to be around. Unfortunately, he smokes like the biggest chimney you've ever seen. He can't change that now at his age. But he is a super, super nice guy. And we regret that we aren't able to spend more time with him just because he's such a neat human being, you know. He's so happy with us too, you know. He knows he's got respect. He knows that when he does good work, it's going to get appreciated. We pay super well. We pay way more than anybody else for, for similar size work. And we pay on time. We don't like take the invoice and six months later send the money. You know, we pay bang on the day. So he likes us and he likes working for us. You know. He still won't put his name on the stuff. Those prints don't have his name on and I'm going to have to do that myself. <laughs> <laughs> we give up on that years and years and years ago. On the to-do list for me for my YouTube videos for the David's Choice, it, it's not happening tomorrow, so this is not a tease. I want to do one of the David's Choice videos and go to his workroom and do like a little interview, just a little miniature tiny documentary, not a documentary, just an interview with Kubota-san have him chat about the old days when he was a, an apprentice and stuff like this. That would be a dynamite YouTube video for us, for our David's Choice channel. When, 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 when. That would be cool, you know, if, if some random TV people came and talked to Kubota-san and whatever, they're just going to ask him the same little questions, you know. Why did you get started in this work? Blah, blah, blah. How long have you been doing this? And all that kind of stuff. They would just ask him the generic questions. But if I went over there and he knew we were coming and we organized it and I went over there and a camera person and whatever, because I'm a printer also, because I've talked to so many guys, because I know how this works, we could have a really, really, really good interview. I don't mean digging and prying and bringing out things that, that, that were secret, just simply I would know how to get him to talk about the things that are really interesting, namely when he was a young apprentice at this thing. That's, that's really the part that is... Uh, We've already got some of this because I've chatted with him about this personally. So I know some of these stories that I would love to have him say to the camera and tell us about, you know, like the, this story about his first day on the job, you know. I'm not sure how much is exaggerated and it doesn't seem really exaggerated. But his story about the first day, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I had that cup of coffee. I, I...
Sorry about the sound effects. Uh, I'm not sure what I can do, you know. Put a muffin in it. I did. I did have breakfast this morning. That's the problem. If I don't eat in the morning and come to these streams, my stomach rumbles, feed me, feed me, feed me. If I do have something, I had a cup of coffee this morning and a little bran bun. If I do feed my stomach, it processes. So which is worse? I don't know. Should I move the mic? If I put the mic here, up right in front of me here, Testing, one, two, three. I'm still sitting here talking, now one, two, three. But now it's away from my stomach. Maybe is that better? <laughs> ASMR, stomach ASMR, sorry. I don't, I can't stop it. It's the pose, it's the, it's the body pose. You know, I'm sitting here. Of course, my stomach at the moment is being squeezed up. There's nothing I can do about it. Stream brought to you by Lawson Brand Donuts. I don't know why they call it Brand Donut. It's not a donut in any sense. I don't know. It's shaped like a donut, so that's why they call it a donut. But, uh, it's my daily chunk of bran. Well, it isn't a brand muffin. I really would like to be able to get some real brand muffins and maybe somewhere in Tokyo you can get such a thing. I don't know, but uh, not here in this district, uh, not at my local convenience store. There's nothing like a real brand muffin. I'd really have to make it myself if I wanted that sort of thing here. The wood here is being a bit recalcitrant. The, the green is, it, the green really sinks sharply. If I'm not careful when I pop a piece out like this, it will take the whole next group with it if I'm not careful. It's, the green is really at a steep plunge angle. So when you're carving one way, when you're slicing one way, it's smooth, but the other way that grain plunges right into the wood. Very, very dangerous. What's someone asking there? Woodblock prints as a hobby. I could not imagine a better hobby. No, it's really, really cool. It doesn't require you to buy a whole bunch of gear. It doesn't require you to have a dedicated workshop or workroom. You can do it literally. I did for the first X years. I did it on the kitchen table. Pack up the gear, have dinner. You know, it's okay, whatever. You don't need tools, equipment. There's nothing dangerous. There's no chemicals. If you're a bit handy, you're okay. If you're not handy, then it's perhaps not the thing to do because you've got to manipulate stuff. And but yes, of course, it's perfect. No investment to get started, zero. You can get started with whatever's in your kitchen and your garage. And nothing toxic. I couldn't imagine a better thing to do if it's interesting for you, yeah, of course. And you stop and start. I don't, with, with one qualification, uh, you can stop and do it for a while and then, I mean, do it for a while and stop and do something else and, and you know, go to work and, and whatever, whatever. With the carving like this, you see me doing this. I do a few minutes a day and then come back in a few minutes and come back in a few minutes. But once printing starts, it's a little bit different. In order to do printing, 
smoothly and competently with good practice, you've got to set aside a bunch of time for it. You can't do printing in just five minutes and then go away and then come back to more five minutes later. You can't do that. For printing, you need to set aside a session for it. You need a few hours to get going, to get the printing tools set up, to get the paper ready, and to do some printing. So in that part of it, you need some, some preparation and some, some time set aside. But the carving side, stop, start, stop, start, you're okay. talking about formaldehyde I know there are some of the guys downtown are still I believe I, I shouldn't say still because I haven't talked to them recently but uh, it it certainly was when I first came here to Japan really common for printers to use form what they call hormalin which is a, a formaldehyde uh, mix and it's funny I actually I have a license to buy that stuff because I got that it used to to, to stop prints from going moldy in the summer. The older printers told me, Dave, you got to use this. Get some formalin from the pharmacy. They, you can't just go in and buy it. They don't sell it to everybody because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fatal for people. It's toxic. So you have to go to the police office first, get yourself a license for it, convince them that you're not going to drug people or something. So I did. I went to the local police office. This is, I, I, I don't know, 30 years ago. I went to the local police office, convinced them what I was doing, they signed and sealed and gave me the paper that I then took to the drugstore and I then bought on a regular supplies of formalin, formaldehyde. So for the first bunch of years when I was doing the Poet series, I used formaldehyde in the summer to try and stop the paper from going moldy. Some of the printers, Seki-san, he used to just slather it on. I visited his house one day in Hachioji. Seki Kenji, he's long, long dead now. Not a, not a formaldehyde poisoning, but... I visited his house, knocking the door. He says, yeah, come on in, come on in, open the door. And there's a wave of, like, I've gone into a hospital room or a morgue. And that's the printer's house, you know. The whole house had, was full of this formaldehyde smell. We now no longer use it. We don't use it here at all. I don't have any in the building. I've got the license. Maybe it's expired. I don't know. We no longer use it. And maybe my exposure to it those years, is it going to kill me? I don't know. No idea. I didn't use it all that much. I didn't use it as much that my house stank of it. You know, I was. I tried to be very, very careful with it. But I did use it for, I don't know, a dozen years or so, I guess. Ten years or so. They both licensed to kill. Are we looking at the shop, the camera? The camera is in the shop, I know, the camera is in the, the shop entranceway. We are looking out left down the street. And in fact, yeah, as you see right now from the other camera here where my right hand is, the you see our flag, that's because the flag at the moment is sitting in the entranceway. We're not open. When we're open, the flag goes outside and you would be able to see that orange cone. The ninjas have, they've replaced their flags because what they do, they leave their flags out overnight. So they disappear. <laughs> so the ninjas are constantly replacing their flags. This is a bar district. People get drunk and when the bars close, people stagger down the street. And if there's anything loose in the way, and I'm, you know, I'm not awake to see it, but it's like whatever, 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night, a couple of drunks come down the street, they see these flags that says, Ninja Experience. What would you do? <laughs> So they disappear now and then. Yeah. 
we bring ours in and tuck it in the entranceway. Mm -hmm. They're really cooking. I think I could probably eat my words or something. I don't remember. It must be on the old streams here from a half year ago. Those guys opened up when? Last October, last November. And I think Dave here sat here and pronounced, and I said something like, I give those guys six months. I probably said something like this. And that was around a year ago. <laughs> That's fine, because they said the same thing about us, I'm sure. Absolutely, I'm sure. They wouldn't have said six months. That guy, you know, on this street, you gotta be kidding. I'll give him six weeks or <laughs> something like that. I have no idea what they said. We are now old timers. This little shop of ours, Mocha Hong Kong, this is now one of the old timers on this street. We've grown up and we're, we survived. You know, businesses like this, it's the first X months, you know. But what people who just look at us don't know is that we are not just a little shop. We have lots of other activities behind us. So people might look at our shop and look at the very few numbers of people that come in and say, man, those guys are never going to make it. But what they don't understand is that there's a whole world behind us, of course. You know. What's this, Dave? Do I have any favorite Japanese movies? I don't. I'm sorry. I've never seen a Japanese movie in my life. That's not true. When I was back in Canada, I used to go to things like Japanese movie festivals and stuff like that. I think here in Japan. Have I ever been to a movie theater? Yeah, Sadako and I used to go sometimes. 20, 25 years ago, she and I used to go to movies. I, I don't have anything to say about movies. I'm sorry. Nothing. It's just not my, uh, if you're new here, then you're asking me, people ask me, Dave, what's his favorite food? What's his favorite book? What's his favorite movie or stuff? I'm really not the person to ask about this stuff because I have a very, very, I'm not saying narrow-minded, I'm not a narrow-minded person, but my, my life and activities these days is extremely narrowly focused. I have very little uh, share in this culture. There's many, many places in Japan I have never been to. I don't travel, so I'm sorry to be disappointing. In, in that, for that kind of question, I'm not your I'm not your go-to guy. There are many, many foreigners in Japan who will happily share all their experiences and knowledges about food and movies and places and culture and temples. It's just not my uh, I'm not your man, you know. Sorry to disappoint, but. Uh, I think on YouTube these days now there are so many that it's, it's a thing it's a huge genre you know foreigners in Japan on YouTube you know telling stories and being interesting and uh, showing stuff that's going on we don't do that I'm sorry but, uh, there's certainly lots of access to this you know.
the finest work hurts my fingers. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. And this kind of topic comes up many, many times. We simply don't overdo it. In any labor like this, whatever, if you're really used to it, you're doing it all day, you're fine. I recently am not doing it all day. I have many, many, many mixed jobs to do. So it's just simply I'll be here this morning for about 90 minutes doing this. Then I'll be doing other work. The only time I get in trouble with my body is if I overdo it after having not done it for quite a long time. We had this a couple of months ago here because I only do one or two hours a day max carving. Recently, I spent an entire weekend doing it a couple of months ago and I hurt my back at it because I wasn't used to it. Yeah. How's our time? 8.37. There's only a few minutes here. It looks like we're going to get noisy because the other work to do next is going to be persuading. So later on in the stream, we're going to be doing some uh, heavy, noisy work. A car, but I can't see it. Part just out of sight. Maybe it's our famous vegetable mirror. I don't know. drama here here well, I mean here in the shop but here in the Saksa yesterday uh, this is a district where lots and lots and lots of uh, filming goes on people film uh, movies TV shows you know it's almost I can't say every day you know whatever but it, there's huge huge amounts of it and the yesterday morning I came down and uh, out in the street not right in front of me here you can't see this way when we point the camera the other way in that area there's a used bookstore there's a couple of shops there's a brush shop in that little group of streets there there was a bunch of tents and backup vehicles and cameras whatever they were obviously doing a, a movie scene or a TV drama scene or something like that and that was early in the morning that was about eight, eight o'clock or so they were starting I stood back for a while and just watched I don't recognize there was some people in very old-fashioned clothes Showa era clothing I think they were filming in the bookstore there but I'm not sure Anyway, I came back in and got busy with my own work. And then, you've probably heard it on this stream, the building that's being torn down on the corner, they're jackhammering out the foundation or something. And then, bingo, exactly, it must have been 8 o'clock, the time is set to do this. Boom, the jackhammer started. And I was a bit curious. I wonder, you know, that's they're filming a movie out there, whatever. So I went outside to the corner just to stand back and see what's happening. And, yep this hadn't been cleared and the movie people didn't know this was going to be happening and the jackhammer people didn't know anything about the movie and there was a big standoff the movie people are all gathered around the construction I'm not I, I have no idea what actual conversation is going on and the movie people must have gone keep me a break what's going on and the jackhammer people are like it's eight o'clock we're allowed to start at eight o'clock we didn't know you blah 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 so there was this must have been a standoff I didn't stand there all the time but I just came back inside, and I remember maybe about a half an hour later or so, the jack hammering started up again. So maybe they made a deal was we're gonna okay, we'll look, we'll give you thirty minutes, you know, shoot whatever you want to shoot, then get out of here or something. I don't know. But there must have been a miscommunication, or A didn't know what B were going to be doing. So you know. <laughs> yeah, we've been there, you know, any number of times over the years. You know, out in Hummer, I got this all the time. 
when I lived in Hamra. We were right next to the Yokota Air Base. So there'd be, I'd be doing the poet series and a TV crew would come. One time there was a film crew with an actual big film camera, you know. And they're here, and all of a sudden we hear, mm, and it's, the guys are doing the, what do you call it? They touch down and take off and go around and touch down and take off and go around. And there's three of them. And it's these Hercules aircraft, the ones with the big four rotors. And there's three of them at, at you know, at around a circle, touching and landing, touching and landing, and coming right over our apartment building. <laughs> so the, and the TV people are like, is this going to go on all day? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we try and do the interview in the intervals between planes bombing over, you know. Whatever, you live in a big city, it's going to be noisy. You know? This morning here, it's nice and quiet out there. Is there a crow action out there today? I can't really hear it. The door closed. It's a bit chilly out there, so I've got the door closed.
crows out there. I guess they are busy this morning, are they? I don't know. What's the garbage? It's a Saturday morning. It's not a garbage day here. Yesterday, Friday was a garbage, burnable garbage day, so there was lots of uh, stuff put out Friday morning. But today's Saturday. It's not one of the local garbage pickup days. So. Don't move. Don't move. You hear the air conditioner out there just went on. That's the air conditioner from Rocks, and it will soon be closing down for the year based on our, our experience. This is now mid-October. And we don't actually notice when it disappears because it's like one of these, the sound is gone, but you don't realize that it's not there. And somewhere probably next month, I'll be one day, oh, I know, I haven't heard the air conditioner for a while. But there it is right now, the wine in the background out there. And it will soon be disappearing for the winter. Until that day in April when we hear Good. Up she comes. Oh, good morning. Domo. Yeah, it's morning. Good morning. Domo. It's from Ome. It's a box from Ome. And this will be prints that are going to be transshipped via FedEx over to the US. We're still limited in shipping to some extent. We can't ship small packets to the US, so we have to group them all into a box. FedEx takes them over there for us. And Jed Henry's staff disperses them for us over there. What's the question? How deep do we have to dig? Just enough so that when we put a piece of paper on the top, when we're printing, paper ink goes on the top surfaces. Well, ink goes, ev not ink, pigment goes everywhere. The paper gets rubbed on the top surface, and usually it's pretty flat, but now and then it sags a little bit. So I have to be deep enough so that when it sags, it doesn't pick up the pigment from the hole. But we have good, strong paper. We rub smoothly. We don't sag very much. And we don't have to go very deep. You'll see uh, in a, well, maybe or maybe not, as I start to go here, when I'm digging this out, because it's wider, there's more chance for the paper to sag, and I have to go deeper right there than I do here. So when, there's no smart ass answer. How deep do you have to go? Deep enough? You find out quickly when you're learning how to make prints by yourself. You cut, 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 you start printing, and you see if you see your blotch in between those two things, that tells you you didn't go deep enough. So it's self-correcting. I mean, at least, I mean, you, you know what I mean. I mean it, it, you learn very quickly how deep you have to go. Going too deep doesn't, it's not good because then with the holes excavated too deeply, not only did it take more time and trouble to do that, but the brush is now difficult to move. The brush smoothly runs across everything, but if there's deep excavations, the brush doesn't run smoothly. It bangs, 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 bangs against all the high spots. Totally driven by experience. We get occasional friction here in the workshop because the carver and the printer aren't always different people. So the carver will try and move along quickly like I'm doing here. Some of these things I've left actually, I'm thinking that might not actually be quite deep enough. And I won't know, but who will know is the person who does the test printing. And she may come back to me and say, Dave, you could have spent a bit more time on this, please. <laughs> Somebody's quoting Lincoln there again, I see. <laughs> Very useful quotes. <laughs> I think I tend to overuse that quote, so I didn't say it this time, but... Uh, I'm trying to avoid becoming that uh, granddad, knee-jerk granddad. When you po poke him with the same question, he always comes up with the same answer, but uh, the same joke. <laughs> so somebody else can step in. We 
you got to do there, right? Somebody said, how many color blocks do you need for a print? And that's when we said that joke, how long do a man's legs have to be? So <laughs> it's a useful answer for a whole lot of questions. You know. How much is enough? The Van Gogh sunflowers question. It's a big question. I don't really have anything to bring to the table on that. You know, I'm just another person with a viewpoint. How that question of activism. This was a deal when I was younger in the 1960s. It was, you know, the, the beginning of the groups like Greenpeace and stuff like this. They had a, a viewpoint that the establishment wasn't moving quickly enough with respect to things like climate change or ecological matters, things like that. And over the years, the same, <coughs> the same situation has played out over the years and decades. It's still playing out now. People would like to see a change in society. How do you make that change happen? <coughs> do you have any right to say that other people should change what they are doing? These are interesting, deep questions to which really there actually isn't any specific answer. I have no specific you know, thing to say on this you know I do certainly see the frustration from people who think we should be organizing our society in a different way using less fossil fuels for example whatever and it's sort of there's the math it's clear on the table what we should be doing every society organization person has inertia it's impossible to change just like that and do this tomorrow from a different way it's actually physically impossible to do that what you have to do is start a trend you have to start moving society a little bit little bit in a certain direction and this huge thing over time would then go in the direction that we sort of know it should go the activists think it's not moving quickly enough that we're not turning the steering wheel hard enough does throwing oil on a sunflower painting or does gluing your hand to the freeway in Britain so it blocks the traffic do these things help that big movement move more maybe they do I don't really know maybe they do as far as personal character I myself I'm not an activist in any way whatsoever Dave's character says, think carefully, plan, look at the result. Okay, we should be going over there. So now do what I can do in my own world to make it go that way. But I do have to recognize that a lot of people don't do those things and that the, the ship isn't turning as quickly as it sort of should turn. This was the same thing back in the 1960s, the Greenpeace and Rainbow Warrior, that kind of stuff. I wasn't part of that. I wasn't an activist back then either. So I don't know, we're each gonna come at this with our own personal character and viewpoint. I will answer this in a certain way. I think that's too much activism that is damaging to society. That much activism is okay. We're each gonna draw our line in the sand here in a different place. Those people in Britain, the extinction, whatever their name is, they've drawn their red line much higher than I drew draw mine. No answer, no answer. So someone's saying there is a, a counter reaction. If you go too far, you will tend to get people who are now going to become hostile to your cause instead of helping your cause. It's 
There's no single answer or single thing to say about this. So. so I'm sorry if that's if that's a, a non-answer. What can I say? It's a non-answer because there's no black and white here. It's gray. It's opinions. It's viewpoints. So it's kind of a non-answer. I'm sorry. You know, at the end of the day, each of us will look inside ourselves. We behave in the way we we think is moral or right. And there's no absolute here. You know. Imagine that if, to put couch this in terms of something that was sort of going to be important to me. Suppose an activist did this. They went to the British Museum next week. And there's a hawk sized great wave, a real original copy, blah, 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 whatever's on display. And the activist sprays something and destroys it. I, I don't know what can I say. I wouldn't have any, I wouldn't feel, oh my God, kill that person. I'm not going to help with their climate change policy now because they've destroyed the great wave. That would make no sense. And I wouldn't say that. I would feel sad, saddened that, uh, that these people felt that that was the only way to get my attention. And I would want to say to them, look, I'm already on board with you. I'm already trying to do this. You don't need to get my attention. But their point of view is, we, are, we as a society, are not moving quickly enough. So both sides are right here, actually. I really don't know. Humans are complex creatures. Human society is astonishingly complex. And very few aspects to it have an easy, understandable 25 words or less answer. You know? I think basically at the moment, if you're a kind of optimistic kind of person in general, as I am, I'm optimistic about myself and my life and about human society, then you will think, okay, we're on this. We're figuring this out. We'll get this thing. There's going to be some hurricanes. Yeah, we're, we've, we've made some mistakes, but we're on this, and we will now get this. So this ship is turning course, and let's just stay with this because I'm an optimistic kind of person. A person who is a pessimist, who has maybe had more bad experiences in their life. They got beaten up as a child or something, whatever. A person that might be pessimistic for whatever reason. They're thinking, oh, no, 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 it's the end of the world. The hurricanes are going to destroy us. We're not doing anything. The ship is not turning quickly enough. So if you're inherently a pessimist, you will want to try and do something to make this happen quicker. If you're inherently an optimist, you're going to look at the good side. Yeah, hey, we're on this. <laughs> so, and that's, there's nothing changeable. I'm going to see this and you're going to see that. And we're both looking at the same thing. You know? Hopefully human beings are fun. And I have no idea. I am an optimist. But that doesn't mean I'm 100% confident we're going to get through this. You know, we may not make it. S human civilization could very much. It, it may end. Within my lifetime, it may end. So I'm an optimist, but I'm also trying to be a realist. Oh my God, we have to fix these problems. You know? Well, someone's saying that you know, all those people that attacked the flower just ended up gathering bad attention, but actually, I think that's not true, actually. There are people who will look at that action and say, well, those people are idiots, they're assholes, they shouldn't be doing this, But so I'm going to burn more fossil fuels. I don't think anybody is going to come to that conclusion. So I don't think in that sense they've hurt their cause. And there is this adage that there's no such thing as bad advertising, that you know, I'm not, I don't quite 100% believe this, but it's out there, the adage that all advertising is good advertising. As long as they're talking about me, it means they're talking about me. And I think that's their viewpoint, the extension people too. It doesn't matter how badly, how, how badly you think of me, you are now thinking of me. This, this you know, topic is now front and center. And that's why they would do these things. Even though they know that it's bad to destroy a painting and that people will be angry, they have put their topic in the news front and center. I think that's the, that's the background here. Just to get on the media, and that has a, it, it works actually, it works. I mean, right now, we here on this little tiny niche Twitch stream, we are now talking about that. 
<clears throat> those people have done an activity that has led this three, four, five hundred people now to talk about this. Somebody asked Dave about this. Dave talks about this. We need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and blah, blah, blah. So in a sense, what they did worked. They've got 400 people here now sort of thinking about this and discussing this. And none of us are going to say, even though I don't like those people, I don't like what we did, I'm going to burn more coal. Nobody is going to say that. Anyway, I guess I'm sorry. That, that's all I can, you know, really add to this. I think. What if it was really personal to me? What if an activist, for some reason whatsoever, just came in Tokyo here, came down this street with a a bucket of crap, opened my door, and threw the bucket in the building, and said, "Here you are." What if somebody destroyed something that? or tried to destroy something that is really in my face right here, right now. We would have to sh close our shop. The customers couldn't get prints, some of my people. If they set on fire, whatever, we'd be out of work. And the activists just destroyed this thing, and they're going to hold up a banner saying, burn fewer fossil fuels. And they've got in the news by destroying my shop. How would I feel about this if that was the case? How do I answer this one? Well, I would be pissed off, obviously, personally. Hontoni, at the end of the day, the answer I would have to give would be the same answer that I gave just now. I get it. <laughs> I get it. So <laughs> don't give them ideas, Dave. It's so cute. <laughs> I don't think there's anything I can say that will, that will influence people like that. It's okay. You know. The thing about this, you know, this is, I, I touched on this a little bit in that video I put up a few months back, that video about the meaning of life, right? At the intro to that video, I talked about this, that uh, the, the chance in each of our lives to be faced with issues and to be faced with discussion and, and somebody asks you a question, you answer it, and then in answering it, you really have to sort of try and clarify your own thoughts about this sort of thing, you know? And I talked about in that in that video that over the past X years now living in Japan, I get very very few, uh, very few chances to do this. Very few chances to okay, Dave, what do you really think about this? And you've got to try and formulate what do I think about this? How do I express this without rambling for three hours? How do I clearly try and formulate what I think about this and what I have to say? And whoever asked this question a few minutes ago, thank you because it gives me a chance to. What do I really think about this? Because it's, you know, we normally don't really spend much time thinking about issues. And in the recent few days in the shop, we opened on October the 1st, and almost every day there has been at least one person in here who has asked me or talked to me, and I end up, I've ended up in a, some really, really good discussions. Yesterday, both of those two guys that were here, the, the first two guys with the kaiju and the baseball bats, and the second man with the, the, the infestation question and the bugs. Man, we chatted for hours. The, he was supposed to be touring around Japan. He sat for two hours talking about you know, infestations in temples. You know. So I learned, I learned, I learned. I put a little bit back in. Um, this, this environment, the shop environment, talking to people, and this little stream here, it's really, I'm enjoying this. It's keeping me alive. There's our vegetable man. Do we have in the chat the guy who keeps asking about vegetables? I'm suspicious of what's going on here. He never comes here while the vegetable man is outside. As in, never. It's gone. And now, you know what's going to happen? 30 seconds from now, this person is going to come into the chat and say, have we seen the vegetable man? I'm suspicious. He's driving that truck. He's going to park it around the corner. He's going to open his laptop and come into the street. Where's the vegetable man? 
I think John had this. John had this the other day. This guy is the vegetable man. Countdown. 30 seconds. He's parking his truck right now. <laughs> I think John nabbed this. I think he did. He called it. We have never seen you together in the same room. <laughs> Vegetable man is joined the chat. <laughs> Actually, so you know, I I know the guy. I mean, I don't know him to talk to. I've seen him. You know, he comes as we talked before. He has a very wide window. He's here at seven, seven thirty, eight, eight thirty, nine, nine thirty. His window is very wide. I have sat here outside, watched him park his truck. I nod, he nods. I've never spoken to him. He's a he's a little guy, kind of shy. He's not a kind of person that I would say, hey, I have an idea for you. I can't say this to him. He's busy. Man, he's busy. He gets, he's got his order book, looks for the package, delivers it, gets back in the truck and goes. You saw the time he stayed today. So he's not the kind of person I can actually chat with and say, would you cooperate with me tomorrow morning, you know, for something like this? So. So I'm sorry, you know, I don't really think, and he's a busy, busy guy at work. I don't really think I want to disturb him. And probably also this would not make him feel comfortable that hundreds of people are watching him at work each day. <laughs> so he seems very efficient. You've seen him, man. Park, park, go, go, bang, bang. He delivers to the, the Niku, the meat restaurant next door, as well as many, many other places around here. Smile, you're on vegetable camera. Yeah, it's funny. You know, he's a meme and he's an internet meme and he doesn't even know it. <laughs> it's bunch of these people in our neighborhood you know it was the shoe lady for a while and now she's moved on now it's the vegetable man you know the garbage the guy in the blue garbage truck you know these people are internet memes and they haven't any idea very small memes in a very small community <laughs> it's so cute <laughs> It's 9-11 here, we've come around. Okay, I'm not about to start persuading now, I'm not at this point either. Okay, there's the main shopping. Oops. There's the main shopping. The carving work on this block is now, I think, finished. <coughs> Normally, it would have been just outlines first. Then the second stage, chisels to chisel out the big wide area. That's what comes next. And then what should happen is third stage with the clearer, clearer chisels. And I've skipped a little bit. I've done stage one with everything. But I also skipped ahead. Instead of doing stage two, I skipped ahead to do the chisel work on all these little areas. So normally, traditionally, it would have been stage one, just cut, nothing cleared out, then clear with the chisel, and then clear with the small chisels. But Dave's character, he wants to work bit by bit by bit, clear it out as we go. It's just my character. And also, it really does help me, Taran San and I talked about this, if I did just stage one with a cutting knife, and you miss a little bit, then you come with your clearing chisels, pop, off she goes. 
So I'm doing it this way partly out of uh, pragmatism. Doing it this way means less mistakes and less errors, even though it's not exactly the official way that the old guys did it. The downside is I have spent, I have wasted a lot of time in picking up and putting down chisels, picking up and putting down. Whereas if I had just carved with my knife all the way around, it would have been much more efficient time-wise. So doing it this way takes, I can't quantify, 10% more time, 20% more time. I don't know, but it does take longer. It doesn't matter. I do it the way that suits me. I do it the way that makes me happy. And the end result, of course, is exactly the same. A good, clean block going to the printers. Okay, there we are. That's our carving work today. And uh, we have now show and tell here, of course. But uh, next stream, today's Saturday. I'll be here again in two days on Monday. And I'm not sure. I might just actually leave this block. So what we might see, you might see this block again then on Monday. And what I might do, now that I think about it, I might do some of the noisy work. I might do a bunch of the noisy clearing off stream. Then for the next stream, I'll finish a little bit of the noisy work and we'll clear up with the wider chisels. So we have content for the stream, but it won't be a half an hour of, of solid banging. So I might do that in preparation for Monday's stream. We'll see. Because I suspect over the next couple of days here, Saturday and Sunday in the shop, I suspect I may not have a whole lot of time to do work here. Okay, show and tell. We've got 15 minutes. I don't remember. I remember where we were up to. The last print we looked at in these books. What was it? It was the uh, tiger. We looked at the tiger. We spent time. Okay, so we've got this one. It's going to be nothing to talk about this one. The, the quick, we, we mentioned this the other day. That be, the, the schedule for this was 10 prints per year. I didn't send one in January. That was exhibition time, business time. And I didn't send a print in August because that was family time. Me and my family, or by this time it was me and my kids, we spent the summer together and I didn't send a print. So I sent 10 prints in the year with two months off. So it was basically four weeks per print, four weeks to five weeks per print. This one took longer than normal because of the extreme amount of delicate carving and the high number of colors. So this one went to the customers late. I don't remember the numbers, two weeks late, three weeks late. So of course the next one following it, I had to catch up. And also I wanted to do this kind of a print anyway. So I picked a book page from a Moronobu book. And it has no colors. The original had no colors. Why did it have no colors? Because it hadn't been invented yet. This is from a book in about 1680. It could have been 1670. I don't remember now. This is so many years ago I did this. This is one book page from an era before color printing had been invented. And also I wanted to practice calligraphy. You know, and it, as I said, I needed a print that I could do really, really quickly. One color, bang, print, out she goes to the customers. But I still wanted a challenge. I don't remember the story here. I'm sorry, I made this many, many years ago and I don't remember the back story. I don't even remember the name of the book I took this out of. If we're curious, if you go to my website, woodblock.com slash sudimono, you will find this in the second series, the second set. And looking at this now, this calligraphy now, this is made in the year 2000. This is 22 years ago. If I'm inspecting this with a third eye here, how did this guy do? Yeah, I think it's okay. This guy, uh, this guy did this. This guy did this. In later years in Ukiyo-e history, calligraphy carving became much more refined and much finer, but this is carved as it should have been carved during that era. I could quibble with a few things. Let's see if I try and find things here. Where am I? I could quibble with a few things. Okay, look at this here in here, where, that, where this cross happens, where this line crosses. There's a bit of a blob. And we see that quite a lot of places where the lines cross. There's a bit of a blob at the point where they cross. Same, same thing, where are we here? It's the same thing here. There's a bit of a blob here. Because I hadn't realized yet that you don't carve what you see. 
you carve a block that prints what you see. How can I explain this? No, this might be too much of a digression. Let's just try if I can explain this in one quick minute. If you've got two calligraphy lines, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? If you've got two calligraphy lines that are crossing, if you cut away this white place, cut away that white place, and you've left just the two lines, you're going to get a blob of ink inside there. So it won't look like two lines crossing. You'll get a blob there. It looks like a woodblock print. So what you've got to do is you have to carve. Let me expand this. Here's the lines. You have to carve deeper here in that corner. You have to carve away wood if there's room for it. So you carve, I'm, I'm exaggerating, you carve like this instead of carving those straight corners. Because when you carve a straight corner, a blob comes into it. If you carve a little notch in the corner and a blob comes into it, then you've got your straight lines. So you don't carve what you want to see, you carve a block that makes what you want to see. I don't know, there's a word for it. Uh, even in, in modern printing with people with offsets and stuff like this, or not offset, but uh, people with a metal type, people who are doing relief printing, they do this. I think Photoshop does this. I don't have any idea how it works in, in the modern commercial world. But the carver also has to be aware of this. You see it right here. There's a blob at the bottom here. So this is a mark of a, of a guy who's on his way. He's doing well, but he ain't there yet. It's okay. It's okay. I was what I was, and I am what I am. Came out very well. The next one. Oh, it's this one. All right. Oh, my God. I could talk all day about this. I, I won't, but I could. this is it. This is it. I waited for this. I had wanted to make this print for years. This is the Surimono album published in the year 2000. And for me, the year 2000 was a bit of a special year. Hiroshi Yoshida, the famous, not the famous Shinhanga designer, Hiroshi Yoshida, died in 1950. Under Japanese law, his copyrights become free January the 1st, 70 years later. His copyrights became open January the 1st, 2001. I carved this print and published it. I actually, I, I, it's. November 2000 that I published this, but whatever, I knew it was safe. It's not the same print I have in the shop now, it's the same blocks I have in the shop now, of course. I did this myself, this is one of Dave's copies that I made back in 2000. The same blocks are here and have been used repeatedly. This print is in our shop. Now also, I said I waited till Hiroshi Yoshida's copyrights were free and clear. I actually didn't need to do that. Because Yoshida himself, in 1939, published a book. I have a link here. I remembered this morning to prepare this link. He published a book in 1939 about Japanese woodblock printmaking, including basically instructions. Draw here, cut here, mix here, put this color here. It's a big, beautiful, fat book on how to make Japanese prints. It's not actually, it's not all a technical book. He talks and talks and talks about the philosophy, 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 spiritualism, but also there's lots of good information in there. It's on the net, free to read, and the tragedy, one of the tragedies of his life. He, he was a good guy. He did lots of things. So his life wasn't a tragedy. But one of the, the things that didn't work out was he published this book to try and introduce the philosophies and techniques of Japanese printmaking to the world. He published it in English in the fall of 1939. Way to go, way to go, nice timing, <laughs> whatever. So the book didn't go anywhere, they probably got pulped. They were, you know, X hundreds of them printed, they are now really, really, really rare because they just didn't get out and around. They are on our website. The link, I just click, poke, poke, clicked you there, you can read the whole thing. And if you go to that page I, I linked and go to chapter five, on that index page, you will see Yoshida gave a complete breakdown of how to make this print. Here's color block A, color block B, color block C. He showed the level that the gradations should be applied. He showed the sideways gradations coming in. He gave 
an instruction manual how to make this print. So Dave here said, thanks for the information guy. I'm on and we'll, we'll do this. So I made it with his permission. Even though he died 70 years ago, we made this print with his permission. Ken-san, good morning. I didn't know you were here today. I thought it was Marcella-san. No, good, okay, it's, it's no problem. Good, good. Stop. Can I quote you on that later? Yes. <laughs> okay. This is Ken, one of the new faces here. He's, he's uh, eager to get learning. He's not super confident yet, but it's okay. Looks good so far, right, guy? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. How do you feel about the work so far? Oh, it's, it's, it's been nice. But I mean, how do you feel about like the prospect of being here and working here and, uh, you oh, know? it's great. Uh, it's great. He's, he's, he's parroting the company line. <laughs> Can you, okay, come say hello just for a minute. We're streaming. Can you, is it okay if you just put your face in? Who, if you, who am I talking to? There are a few hundred random people on each other. Come in the back okay. here. I'm, no, I'd rather. Just, just, okay. just say hello just for one second. And we're not going to interview you or, or ask for your life story. This is Ken Ichikawa. We have an Ichikawa upstairs. This That's is right. Ken Ichikawa. Just a little, little bit more. And oh. he's, uh, he's sort of training here, the, the idea being to be a person helping us in the shop here. Yes. And as you mentioned, so far so good. I don't know, he's very quiet. He can't yet grab customers and explain a whole bunch of things, nor do we expect him to be able to. But so far, look look at this. Hello, 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 Ken, 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 you're good. So greetings for you. Well, it was nice yep. meeting Ken. everybody. I can see he's going to be a bit shy. Ayama son comes here and she's like, she's ready to talk and show it. <laughs> it's okay, relax. That's not part of your job description, so don't right. worry about it. <laughs> Where were we? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where were we? So the uh, the other thing about this print is Yoshida in his book, one of his big claims to fame was that he had the idea that by painting on the blocks, you could create completely different moods in your woodblock prints. So the first print that they proposed with this was this is perhaps an evening scene of a boat on the inland sea. But in that link that I sent to you just now, he showed how with the same set of blocks, you could put the pigment on in different ways and make a completely different print. I didn't prepare one, but I know where there is one. Just let me grab this, 20 seconds, one sec. missing a chance. We've got stock here for browsing in the shop and then there's backup stock and we must have sold the last one of this in the main stock and nobody pulled it out of the backup stock. He has work this morning. Here's the idea. It's almost the same set of blocks. Same set of blocks plus one. There is one overall deep block with some holes cut out of it and there's a yellow blank block behind. So it's 99% the same block set the same key block, the same sky, the same sea, the same shadow, the same boat, the same everything. And this was one of Yoshida's main claim to fame. He was really famous and noted for this, that you could take a set of blocks and make some incredibly different prints from them. My version is the same as the one that was in the book. These are, these are Yoshida had some big, big prints. My version, you see the size here, this is the size, the same as the one that was in the book. And yes, we used it on this year's share certificates. We shrunk it down and stole it again for this year's share certificates. Then one last point about this. If you imagine then, you've got a set of blocks. You're a printer, you're starting a new job, you're getting ready to make the first version of this. You've got your wood blocks, they're clean, there's no pigment on them yet, here you go. Okay, make a test print, please. And what I'm getting at is this. 
a set of blocks is capable of doing this or this or anything in between. A little bit darker on the, on the sails, a little bit deeper on the shadow, a little bit lighter on the sky. You can totally, absolutely change the mood of the print. Karen here, who was here last week, she's making landscapes and she showed me some of her proofs of her latest print. And it's night and day and this is a blessing and a curse. We have the freedom to do anything. With that set of blocks, you can create a print that would make people laugh or cry or feel warm or feel cold, all with one set of blocks. That's your freedom to do it. And the curse is, it's damn difficult. It's really, really, really damn difficult to find it. And once you've found it, then make your 100 copies all exactly the same. Blessing and a curse. And it's the heart of our job now with this 20th century stuff. In the old ukiyo-e days, the same thing was there. You could take a set of blocks and the kimono could be red or the kimono could be purple or it could be yellow, whatever. Big deal. It was basically the same picture. But now in this world of Shin Hanga prints, it's infinite. Absolutely infinite. And I say that knowing what that word means. There's no end within human experience to the possibilities from any one set of blocks. And this is a simple, straightforward, simple example, just with the same piece of wood, how dramatically different it could be. We're making new Shinaga prints now, you know, the new Eight Cats, the Evening Bell for, for the Eight Cats series. We are struggling with it, and this is exactly why we are struggling with it. We have a rough guide from the designer, We've carved our set of blocks, and now we have got proof after proof. I don't even know, we're up to dozens of proofs now, and we haven't yet been able to find and create one that says, yeah, that's the print I want to publish. When will it happen? I don't know, no idea. Okay, we are out of time. I am gonna get busy with Ken, getting this place warmed up, get the lights on, get the vacuuming done, and we'll be opening it up and running. I'll see you again two days from now, Monday morning. I guess it'll be finishing off that same block, I suppose. Monday morning. And here we are. Quiet Asaksa, which is going to be hopping for the rest of the day. It's menu wars down there. Do you see it down at the left-hand side? We have the soup curry, soup kare flag. And then right next to it, where that lady is walking, there's a new menu put out by the Korean hot dog place. And it's a little bit kind of like Menu Wars. Who can claim the bigger space? I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm out of here. See you later. See you Monday morning. Look at this. One masked Japanese, one non-masked foreigner. Is he coming in here? No mask. I don't need no mask. I'm a man. <laughs> okay, bye for now. See you next time.